So what you're seeing now is the creation of a Go routine, and that Go routine is just blocked on that listen and serve call, which is accepting traffic on port 4000 and then executing any of those endpoint, uh, endpoints um, if they exist. I want to talk about again this Go routine that you're seeing right here on line 101 that we're constructing and it's being blocked on listen and serve for those debug endpoints. So essentially, this is what we've got going on right now. We've got our main Go routine, main Go routine, and it's moving down this path of execution. At some point, it, it it's stops, waits for a signal to shut down. And what we've just done is now started a second path of execution that now blocks on that listen and serve call, right? It's essentially now a mux waiting for traffic from the outside world. And then it launches more Go routines um, when it, we hit any of those endpoints. It's essentially where we're at right now. We've got the main path of execution. We've got our debug, which blocks here on the mux. Now, I want to share with you a general rule that we do want to follow. And remember, all general rules do have an exception. So the general rule is that when it comes to concurrency and creating Go routines, I, I want you to think about this as a parent-child relationship. It really helps to think about Go routines in a, in a parent-child relationship. In this case, this Go routine is, the, is a parent. This is the child because this Go routine is the one that created this one. So always think in terms of parent-child relationships. Now, as a general rule, we don't want child Go routines terminating before their parents. As a general rule, we don't want to do that. We, if, if we, we want to maintain order with all that concurrency that's going on. The parent Go routine is responsible for the child Go routine. It is responsible to know when it's running and when it's not. And as a general rule, we would prefer that the parent Go routines do not terminate until it knows that the child Go routines have. All right. As a general rule, we want this. Now, what is the problem when a child, when the parent Go routine terminates first? What is the problem when the parent Go routine terminates first? Well, what the problem is, is you end up with an orphan. You end up with an orphan Go routine, okay? Suddenly, some, some Go routine here launches another Go routine here, and then suddenly the parent Go routine disappears. We have what I call an orphan. Nobody even knows that this Go routine exists anymore. And then when that happens, if you're trying to shut down the system, you can't necessarily wait for this Go routine to finish, and maybe it's doing super important work. And now you have corruption. And this is really hard to, to debug. And so as a general rule, we do not, as a, well, not a general rule. We never want orphans. Eh, let's say a general rule, we don't want orphans. As a general rule, we don't want orphans. So what are you supposed to do in this scenario? In this scenario, if the parent Go routine is going to be terminating, it has the responsibility of handing off those children to another Go routine. Normally, or usually in these cases, the main Go routine ends up adopting it. Now, how do you do adoption in Go? What I will tend to do is I will have a package that has an API that's managing all of these Go routines, right? and I'll have some sort of shutdown or stop method. And the idea now is that it's the job of the main Go routine to call shutdown or stop. In other words, the, the management of all those children are embedded in the instance of that value for that package that we're, we're talking about. And the responsibility for, for wait, shutdown, or stop moves away from this parent Go routine and moves to the main Go routine. So you got to have the facility to allow another Go routine to sort of take ownership or adoption. 
When I don't see that, when I'm looking at concurrent code, I get really, really scared, all right? So as the general rule, we want child go-routines to terminate before their parents. Their parents should not terminate until they know they have. In the cases where you can't, that, that parent uh, go-routine has to terminate, then there has to be a handoff, primarily to the main go-routine and primarily through some sort of API. This absolutely happens, this exception will happen when you have a web request and you want to do some concurrent work on it. You can't hold the web go routine, the web request go routine hostage because it has a certain amount of time to what? Respond back. And so you've got to release the parent. And don't use that parent's context either for the children because they're all canceled, right? And so the idea now is we've got to maintain some parent-child relationship. So no orphans. However, look at this line of code on line 101. Technically, I am creating an orphan go routine here. Technically, once we get to line 111, there is no more tracking of this go routine. I am creating an orphan. In other words, when this server, when this service shuts shut down, this go routine will be shut down with extreme prejudice. Now, why am I doing this after I had an entire conversation with you to not create orphans? Because in this case, there's nothing that's hurting the state of the service with this orphan. This orphan is just reading, profiling, and metrics data. There is no reason to add extra complexity to make sure this shuts down before the server shuts down. In fact, I would argue that if you're waiting for this MUX to shut down before you shut down the service, you're doing an injustice to the service. Why should we hold the service hostage for 30 seconds, God forbid we're running a CPU profile, when that CPU profile is not important. What's important there is the shutdown. So I want you to find these situations in code. I want you to recognize, oh, whoa, oh, 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 that's an orphan. There's no tracking of this anymore. There's no wake groups, there's no channels, there's no orchestration. Is this okay? Is it okay to have this orphan? In this particular case, the answer is yes. This is a perfect exception to create an orphan. But a lot of times the answer is no, the developer is just missing the idea that someone has to take uh, ownership of that go routine if it's no longer the parent's responsibility. And it just really works well when you're thinking about child-parent relationships here. So I want you to recognize that that's an orphan. That being said, we now need to do the following, right? We now need to create another MUX that is going to be managed by another Go routine to handle our application level traffic. Now, this, these endpoints are hitting databases. They're doing reads, but they're also doing writes. Here's a situation where we cannot terminate until we know all of these child go routines have terminated. We cannot terminate here. We have to do what's called load shedding. And again, all of these go routines are gonna end up having to be the responsibility of the main go routine being the parent in this sense. So what we're gonna have to do on shutdown is ask this go routine here, hey, I need you to shut down and this go routine is going to say, okay, wait, because I need my child go routines to shut down. It's going to wait for its children. This has to wait for its child, all right? And then we can shut down cleanly. So we need load shedding here. And what's beautiful is the HTTP package gives us this. This was introduced a long time ago uh, to the HTTP package. So we have the support. We just have to implement it. Because if we allow these go routines to shut down with extreme prejudice, it could be in the middle of a transaction, a database. The worst thing would be a database transaction that never gets rolled back or committed. Now you're in a lot of trouble. So it's really important that this stuff shuts down cleanly. So let's start to look at some of that code that we need to be able to do a proper load shedding shutdown um, and then we'll introduce the MUX part of, of what we're doing. All right. 
Let's go back to our main code here. There it is right here. Okay. So I'm going to steal a little bit of code now, again, for what we need. We're going to start that API service. We're going to have that logging. We're going to create our shutdown um, channel again for the shutdown signaling like we had before. But in this case, we're not going to use the function listen and serve. What we're going to do is construct an HTTP server value, which has the method listen and serve and provides the facilities for uh, a load shedded um, shutdown. All right. You can see here that we're also applying a standard library logger for any extra logging that might occur underneath the covers. This is how the HTTP package has provided that support. The error handler here is appointed to a log.logger. Slog converts uh, its logger to that API. It all works. Okay. I've left the handler nil because there's bigger conversations to have with that just yet. That will be the mux. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to steal this code and we're going to clean it up. Okay. So we're going to launch our Go routine, which is blocking on listen and serve again. However, this listen and serve can return an error on shutdown or while it's running and on shutdown but we can receive any errors from the listen and serve call through a second channel that we're creating on line 126. So at this point, we have two channels, one to signal a shutdown, say from Kubernetes, and one to signal that we have some sort of error on our accept logic networking side. And then we block on the two channels using a select case. Ideally, we should never receive a signal on this case, hopefully never ever. We never have that sort of networking ever. Um, we do want to receive signals on shutdown. And when we receive a signal on the shutdown, other than some logging here, we construct a new context with the shutdown timeout, and then we call the shutdown API from our server value. Anytime an API takes that context like this, it's asking for a certain amount of time we're willing to wait. So whatever that timeout is, we will wait for a clean and orderly shutdown. However, we can't wait forever. So at some point, we may have to kill some of these go routines with extreme prejudice because at the end of the day, we do have to shut down. We can't be a zombie process. And in that case, we call close and just to really make sure everything is, uh, is shut down as properly as possible. And this is what's holding our server now from shutting down. And it's this right here that's um, allowing main go routine to ask essentially this go routine to start shutting things down. So that parent child relationship and there's go routines in here that are managing the child go routines that they're creating. So it's all pretty cool here. All right. And we get all this for free from the standard library. Mm -hmm.